Do you know how many videos he has of uh, tables? Why? Oh, are you going to go back? Keep it in me, take it. If you want to look at the story, um, with uh, how the right, the, um, the, uh, you have to stick it in the thing 10 times, and, and, it's, and only then, so then it's only one that you get the uh, cold food. In the story of my youth, I'm not even told it. Yeah, we asked, we asked to become interested in Malachi, we're sitting in front of the king of uh, Persia. I used to look at the Tamayo and Suriga, and there's the, some, some food that was brought before them. Because I found out in the economy, he ends up. Because I have the body, but he tried it and uh, gave it back to him. How did that uh, start his name? But then he, he stuck in the ground 10 times. The uh, form of his uh, cashing it. And plus I have it in my Yuda, and then he gave it to my Yuda. So I'm in my Yuda, but I don't care, I'm not going to sell my Yuda. And he was talking about himself, he said, now what about me, I'm not Jewish, why are you doing the needs, why are you sticking in the ground for...
these three uh, small states, which were independent at the time, and they became communist. And in uh, June 41, the Germans actually invaded Russia. And um, one of the things that the uh, Russians did was they took every German citizen and they exiled them to Siberia. Now, was any German citizen in Russia, and um, they came to arrest them and put them on trains and sent them to camps in Siberia. And um, the suffering that he went through in Siberia, uh, he was a young boy at the time, I think it was before my mitzvah, or just after, somewhere around the time, 12, 13. He said to me, he says, so we got out of Germany, you know, whatever, what did it help us? I told him, I said, the Gemara says that Golos Mechapa Nechza. The Golos is Mechapa in half. So I say, the fact is, unfortunately, the whole family didn't survive, but someone from the family survived. Golos Mechapa Nechza. Without the Golos, even that, one doesn't know. And if, had the Soviets not exiled all the German citizens, they would have been killed by the Nazis um, uh, half, a, half a month later when the Nazis invaded. So in essence, those who were in Siberia, as terrible as it was, um, it saved a handful of Jews, and you know, these things are known historically. But he was about my mitzvah, during Pesach, what was it? He was about my mitzvah in the camps over there. He was, he wasn't. Um, uh, he was sick with typhoid, though, like a terrible disease which could be fatal, and came Pesach, and they barely had anything to eat, at least anything kosher or Pesach to eat. So his father was a doctor, told him, look, he says, I am here, I'll do whatever it takes, and I won't eat any of it. But you, you're sick. And uh, therefore it's Bukhok Nefesh, and it's Bukhok Nefesh, then you can go and eat the Chomets because you need it, because you're sick. So he wouldn't hear from it. On the other hand, his father insisted. So finally he made a deal with his father. He says, you know what, we'll take it day by day. Every day, one day I want to eat Chomets, we'll see how I feel, we'll see. We'll see what the situation is. You're a doctor, you'll decide, you know, if you need or not. So to that, his father agreed. And with that, he was able to pull off one day after one, after another, the entire Pesach, without any comments. And as I said, we're talking when he was 12 or 13. And this is the, what the Chinook that uh, people that uh, lived upon, when he came in the camps, they made him work on Shabbos. So there was no choice, there was no choice. It was really because of Nefesh, but you have to really uh, you have to really exhaust all the other methods to see if you can prevent yourself from working. So there was one thing that they hoped that they could do, and it was him and the refugees that was there. What was his name? Who, uh, the first Shabbos, they actually hid in the cesspool. They hid in the cesspool for the whole Shabbos. It's uncomfortable, whatever. But it's better than working on Shabbos, it's better than being with all Shabbos. But the next shot was really that didn't work because someone was marching on them, someone told them, whatever, so the uh, people in charge found them. But that's what he went through in order to, 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 to prevent himself from being with Chal Shabbos. If it's because of Nevis Wine, but if there are other ways to do it, then he walked out of shul and I meet him and I wish him a good year. And uh, he tells me, I don't know how the conversation started, but he tells me a story that I got that. Um, when he was in the camps, he was out in Kira. And um, the camps had barely had what to eat, and they had to work. And all he had for the Sudam of Sekes, all he had was one carrot. That's all he had, one carrot. And it's a long out in Kira afternoon, and they see the sun's about to set, and he ate the carrot. And the next day, he had to work the whole day. It was Bukhok Nefesh. But they actually fasted with all the difficulties. On the one carrot, he had no problem working and fasting that entire day. And when I heard that, I just broke down in tears. And, and, and we live in a life, and Baruch Hashem, you know, 60, 70 years later, which is hard to believe how the situation changed uh, the, of the Jewish people. But one of the big things that changed was there's probably no place on the globe today where the Jews have any laws that prevent them from keep from following Torah mitzvahs. In those years, during the Soviet Union, people it was punishable by death, officially and unofficially. And the Germans and wherever, today there's no place on the globe where people have an excuse. Why not to keep Torah mitzvahs? There's everything available. We don't have these veneers, we don't have these things that stop us from doing things. And sometimes small things, uh, we're going to David Meyer before uh, the Suda, 
and they complained to me that his supper is going to be late in a few minutes. You know, I thought to myself, why did Ben Shalom, the supper is going to be late? These are people, you know, who serve Hashem, you know, didn't have what to eat, you know, five minutes of the supper, ten minutes of the supper didn't really bother them that much. What I mean is, we have to put things into perspective. And we, are, we live in a fortunate generation that we don't have to go through these concerns. But we should know the people, unfortunately, you always hear the people who went through these difficult concerns and sometimes failed or sometimes, you know, uh, had bad results. But there are plenty of people who came out from these stories more strengthened than ever. And um, a web seems to tell us one of them goes to tell the story of the Satan Rav after the war. He first came to Yerushalayim, and he was in Yerushalayim for two years, and then he decided Yerushalayim was not the place where he wanted to build his community for whatever reason, and went to America, went to Williamsburg, and that's when he decided that that's where his headquarters are going to be. <coughs> and he came over to him and says, Rabbi says, when you leave, who should I give my fiddle to? So now I give it to you, who should I give my fiddle to? So the Rabbi says to him, he says, look, he says, you walk into Shul one morning, and you see a Jew, Putting on filling, he rolls up his sleeve, and you see he has the number from the concentration camp on his arm. And the guy's putting on filling, he says, he's the guy who you should give his filling to. Because the person went through what he went through, and he's a fully eat, you know, he's worthy of, 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 of uh, you should give him a filling. That we, we, we live, the foundation of the family is the strength of such people and what they endured and as I said came out stronger from it. I want to finish off with a, with a, with a personal story. Um, after uh, my daughter was born, I wanted a bracha from him that uh, should have a son also. So I asked him for a bracha. Whatever, he didn't want to give. Whatever he had to give, um, a year and a half later my son was born. Um, actually again a few months later my son was born. And every Friday night in those years, he, he stayed at home, as I said, he used to walk in just, you know, Friday night, he was asking for the Torah, and I was lucky if I had a good one. If I didn't have a good one, he'd say, Landy, that's not good enough. Next week, you're gonna have to give me another one. Sure. And he couldn't fool him, you know. He was, uh, I walk in with my daughter, get a bracha, and uh, my son was born, um, Yudal Peters, this was a my boy man. And for two weeks, uh, my wife didn't come out, but that Friday night, um, my wife came out also. He came with the boy also. He gave him a bracha also. And then the next week, I called my wife and I say, you should know that what our son was hurting to this Friday night, unfortunately, he's not going to be hurting to again. Because that week, he passed away. Right after he gave him a bracha the first time, the only time, that week, he passed away. So he passed away. but. The continuity, the family, the yeshiva, and everything, we have to take encouragement, we have to take chizuk from memories of this wonderful person. I want to make a small effort, and I regret that I only made a small effort as a place in Penebrak that to document all these stories. I wanted, it's called the Zachir Shashem, I wanted they should document and write down this story as well. I called them up once, they said to follow up on it. Unfortunately, they didn't. And uh, most of it is lost, unfortunately. We don't know, but we know it's probably a fraction of what he endured and what, what, what he went through this whole thing. These things are important for us to give us chizr to keep us going. So we have the suit of the yard site, and it's time to sit and think and admire um, the greatness of, of this person and other people who, who, who went through this, this period. Nonetheless, they were able to lay the foundations for the future Yiddishkeit in the United States and the United States.